Uh, okay, let's get started then. Welcome to writing smart contracts with Pact. Um, just to orient myself here, I'd like to get a survey of what OS's we're using. I guess we have Mac OS, I assume, for both you guys. Linux, distro. Nix OS, but I have Debian in the CH root. Okay, um, good to know. Um, Mac, 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 okay. So I would like to, just before we get to any talking, I would like to get the install going on, on the, there is a chance that you, you will need to do like a stack build that could take some time. And so I'd like to kick that off now. Um, this is our general uh, approach to setup. We, like, like I just mentioned, we do recommend Atom. That's the one that we have the best support <coughs> for. So if you're willing to install Atom, that will probably make your life easier for this, for this workshop. Um, if you're using Windows or Linux, we have, or check out this pre-built binaries link. We don't have Windows binaries there, but we have Linux binaries there. That w is gonna be your easiest way to get uh, up and running with the packed binary. If for some reason that is not gonna work for you, you can clone this packed repo and you can do a stack build. You can also do a Nix build. Uh, and I, I don't know, not all of it is cached. We are still working on, on the cache infrastructure, but so stack build, Nix build, not sure which one will finish first, but both of those should succeed. So um, if you can, like, like, let's maybe take a couple minutes, either try, try this pre-built binaries link, um, or if you're on Mac, the brew install, cadena slash packed slash packed, and editor support you can do now, you can do later, that's not as big of a deal, but I just want to get to the point where packed is at least building so that we're using our time efficiently for the next little bit. Also... This link here on the whiteboard is a link to the slides that you see on the screen. And you can go here and you can get a direct link if you don't want to have to retype this link for the pre-built binaries. Nix-build. Nix-build. I just did it today, I think. Um, so producible. If it works for you, it should, it should work for me. So I, feel like, I feel like this is a one megabyte per second network. So. That could be a problem. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Okay, so that, right? that may be problematic. Yeah. Um, we, we noticed, we just released it like yesterday or the day before, uh -huh. and there, there might be some bugs. So you may want to get the pre-built binaries for the previous version from this, okay. from this. Um, I don't know of a way to do that with Brew. I would, I would recommend going the pre-built binaries route. Whoops. The brew route does get you the most recent, um, and I don't know of a way to downgrade that. So. So I'm just about to do the brew. Are you, are you recommending not? Try this downloads page first, yeah. And just uh, there's a Mac binary there. Unzip that. Put it in your path. And once you have a packed binary running on your machine, just like let me know, and then we'll we'll move on. So um, we're going to be going through building a smart contract using using the packed language that Cadena has created for smart contracts. Oh, no worries. <laughs> No worries, move on to the right room. That's perfectly fine. Sorry. Not a problem. <laughs> okay, 
everyone has a REPL. Uh, if we have any, any issues, we'll kind of revisit those later and help you work through them. So I'd like to start with a little blockchain 101 first, just to get a feel for who we're, who we're talking to here. Um, like to look at a couple questions. First of all, what do blockchains do? Any, any uh, thoughts or answers? They scam people. Scam people. <laughs> Excellent. We have a skeptic. Very good. Other, other thoughts? Decentralized transactions. Decentralized transactions? Okay. Distributed consensus. They bring a Distributed consensus. consensus. What is Bitcoin? It's a very really complex things. map between between public keys and and uh, integers. <laughs> <laughs> I I won't dis dispute that one. Um, distributed ledger. Distributed ledger. Yeah, this is a definite a, a commonly heard term. What are smart contracts? Something very few people understand. <laughs> Any other procedures to do functional updates on a ledger? Ah, yes. How do smart contracts run? Everywhere the same. Yeah, that's certainly one property. Millions of times more expensive than, uh, <laughs> than, than, than running them by yourself. Yeah. They have to sensibly be a function of the current data on the ledger. Yeah, uh, I, I will definitely mention that. And where can you run smart contracts today? On everyone else's machine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so my answers to these questions, what do blockchains do? My answer is that they store distributed state in a tamper-proof way. And this is tracked by this idea of distributed consensus. Bitcoin is basically that where the state that we're storing is a ledger. So we have distributed tamper-proof ledger and just so happens that allows us to uh, behave like a currency. And, and like transmit value that is scarce and can't be. Uh oh. I didn't do anything. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, we have some distributed state. That's a blockchain. Bitcoin took that idea and put a ledger on top of it. Smart contracts are, instead of putting a ledger in, as your state, put code in the state, which is uh, was Stevens' stored procedures term. And then once you put this code in the state, then people can interact with that code and they know that everybody is, is, has a, the same understanding of what code is being run and thus what is going to happen when that code is run on particular inputs. How are they run? We have this, this large distributed network and the way that we get this tamper-proofness and uh, one might even say immutability is we have all of these nodes that are, that are keeping track of it. And if we're doing, dealing with smart contracts, then those, all of those nodes that are participating have to run these smart contracts as well. So they're run everywhere. And uh, that has some interesting implications. Where can you run smart contracts today? Ethereum is the one that everyone knows. They were kind of the first, the first people to really um, get, get significant adoption with this idea of smart contracts. Hyperledger, another, another example. Kadena, we have, we have our own private blockchain where we have um, Pact and smart contracts running for some of our customers. Question? Is your VM the EVM or something different, or you have your own? VM? It's our own thing. Yeah. Own it's packed, actually. Okay. As as we will get to. <laughs> yeah. 
the, 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 the whole VM is in, is in the Git repo, right? Um, I, if I understand your question correctly, it's just the, it's just the language. And the, so the, the packed interpreter is kind of the VM. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. We don't really use, the, like the term VM it usually means, is used to refer to a different idea. So at least I don't think of it as a VM. But if you want to think of it that way, then, then yeah, I would say that the packed interpreter is the is the, the thing that's actually executing the code is, is a packed interpreter in this case. VM usually implies in, in, oh, compiling to some bytecode. To a bytecode, which we do not do. Right. Um, which we're, we're about to get here. Um, so packed. What is packed? It's a DSL that makes it possible to easily write robust smart contracts. And a few, a few notable characteristics here. It's Lisp-based. It's Turing incomplete. It is human readable, and, and this, I think, is actually a really significant thing. If you want to go figure out what, what, what something does on the Ethereum blockchain, all you have is bytecode. And then you have to decompile that bytecode, and, and that's always well, that's a mess. Really <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think that this, is, this human readable component is really significant and definitely the right choice. Um, you know, maybe, maybe some of the other, these other criteria, I would say, I would argue that they're the right choice, but I wouldn't be, be confident enough to say definitely, but at, at, at the human readable one, I think that is definitely the right choice. This places a lot stronger stability requirements on the source code and the language. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's true. Um, as opposed to like the stability requirements being on the VM bytecode. Right. Spec. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, it also, PACT also has key management because key management, as was alluded to in some of your answers, is, is really core to what, what happens on blockchains. You really, keys are the identity. And you, you put a public key out there, and whoever holds the private key is the person that, that you're talking about. Uh, everyone, a lot of people are familiar with the, the maxim, you know, don't invent your own crypto. Uh, so, so we want to provide these crypto primitives that, that make it as easy as possible to say what you want to do and not have to worry about the details. And we also have some formal verification. Um, the formal verification is in 2.4, which we have been, been discovering some troubles with, but it's, it's very soon going to be available. Um, Joel here in the back is one of the main guys working on the formal verification. So we're, we're really excited about, about the formal verification work that's been coming. So these, these previous characteristics of blockchains lead to some um, constraints on our programs and like a, a unique execution context. And like we said before, every node executes the code. What does this mean? It means the code must be deterministic. Every node in the network needs to get the same results when they execute the same program with the same inputs. And that means you can't read from dev random. You can't, you can't make web requests because you don't know what's going to come back. Um, now, there, there's definitely work in creating creating some kind of oracles that can get data into the blockchain from the outside world. But as far as the code goes, it's got to give you the same result every time. Otherwise, it really defeats the whole purpose. You don't have a, a consensus on what this code does. There's also, uh, this gets to a little bit of our choice of Turing incompleteness. This code is running on millions of computers all over the place. You need to have limits on how much com computation it can do. Ethereum does this with a gas system. We may not be as critical of having a gas system because we are Turing incomplete. You don't have arbitrary recursion. But uh, we also may want to have a gas system as well. But uh, that's another like fairly unique constraint of blockchain coding. 
Um, so I think this stuff is, is useful to keep in mind because it really, as we're going to see as we get into implementing the, the topic for the, this workshop, these, these things have some impact. So getting into a little more detail. There's a packed, we, we have kind of two, two things that we talk about with packed. There's a packed file and a REPL file. The packed files, the reason we have made this separation is because the packed files are going to be the thing that actually goes into the blockchain. And so you want to do your testing with the actual thing. You don't want to like modify your, your packed file locally for testing and then uh, like, oh, let me undo those modifications before I upload to the blockchain. So we've, we've separated packed files and REPL files. REPL files are where you use the things in your packed file. And there are extra functions that you can only do from the REPL or REPL files that you cannot do in packed. And those functions are significantly uh, about setting up the necessary environment, public keys, like establishing whatever key that you're operating under at the moment. All that stuff is, is just kind of uh, context that has to be, that, that exists if you're running in the blockchain that you, you have to sort of set up a shim for somehow. And, and this is part of why we have REPL files and we, we make them separate things. So two, two things that you'll commonly see in REPL files are a call, calls to the env-keys and env-data functions. Those set up some of this environment. And a very common convention is having env-keys and env-data be the first two things at the top of your REPL file. You're, you're just setting up the keys that have to be set up for any kind of execution. Um, we have a whole list of REPL only functions in our documentation. Packedlanguage.readthedocs.io gets you to the, the main documentation page. You'll probably want to pull that up uh, because you'll, you will definitely want to refer to that pretty heavily as we get into the coding today. Um, let's see. I was just going to show a little example. So we, we mentioned this later. At cadena.io slash tripact, we have a web-based REPL that you can use to just play around with packed code with, with very little overhead and installation. And the thing that I wanted to point out here, which was not obvious to me when I first started playing around with it, this, this REPL needs the REPL stuff set up for it. So these first two things that you see in, in the demo examples on our REPL, env data and env keys, these are part of the REPL file, but not part of the packed file. But because of the way we, we built this REPL for the moment, there, we, we need to have them all in the same thing. Like this code that you're loading is a REPL file. And so you can, instead of having a separate .packed file, you can just have your .packed file inlined in here. And so that's what this is. And that's how to interpret these example code um, that we have in, the, in our web REPL. Can you Question? Fonts, please? Ah, yes. How's that? Okay. Um, we have a few other demo contracts. All of them, you'll see, we have these kind of env data, env keys at the top where we're setting up various key things that are needed to demo the actual thing. And so env data, env keys, begin TX, all of these things are REPL things. And then the actual pack stuff starts in down here. This was not obvious to me when I started, and I think it's it's an important thing to point out. Um, we're not going to be dealing much with the REPL here in the browser, so you may not need to worry about that too much today, but I did want to highlight that. Um, let's see. Where did my slides go?
Okay, one more thing that I wanted to highlight. I'm assuming a fair, fair amount of programming knowledge coming in here. Is, is that not true for any, any of you? I don't believe so. Um, these JSON idioms are, are not necessarily obvious from the beginning. So you're going to have to deal with JSON data structures at some point in the code we're going to write today. And if you have a JSON object, whoops, oh, I, can't, I can't highlight, I guess. This JSON object here, if you want to like do object.foo, the way that you do that in PACT is using this at function. Um, I overlooked that initially because the at function is also used for indexing into arrays. Uh, and similarly, if you want to set something, use the plus function and put the thing that you're going to set on the left. So the, the one on the left takes precedence. As you can see, there's, there's a foo here and there's a foo here. And the one on the left uh, is the one that gets put into the output. So this allows you to set fields in a JSON structure. This is a, a pretty useful idiom. And um, just kind of another useful idiom. You can do this with, with other functions, but the with read function provides a really nice, convenient way to read a row from a table and extract a particular field from the JSON data structure. Um, is the type of an app call uh, dependent on the first argument? Like, is the type of that expression or something? And if you pass, but if you pass bar instead, the type of the app call would be string? Yes. Interesting. So you're dependent on like the function type of the string that passes the first argument? I believe so. so I'm a little like hazy. Well, it's unknown, and you don't know whether it has food or bar or something else in it, and you couldn't pass that. So originally, packed was was untyped, yeah. and then we right. we well, went back and like added it. added some type checking well, functionality. It, yeah. Um, last year. Yeah. So, so, so it was, yeah. The evolution there is, I think. Yeah insightful as to like how these things will work. They originally started out as untyped and then we've been fleshing out more type checking functionality. And there's actually a type check command that are, you, you'll probably see in some of our examples where in your REPL file, you can say load this module and then type check this module. And, and you can get type errors that way. So I just wanted to point out those, those idioms. Now there's a couple ways to run PACT. So the, the easiest and, and quickest way is going to be to use Atom, as we mentioned before. Um, that would be my recommendation. I was strongly averse to installing Atom, but of course I had to teach this workshop, so I didn't really have much of a choice. It, it does make things pretty nice. Um, well, uh, just to show a little, a little demo, the way that I so bigger? Yes, please. Okay. How's that? Better. Okay. Um, the way that I personally develop PACT is I have my PACT file on the left. I have my REPL file on the right. Um, when I make any changes, Adam automatically compiles this stuff and runs it on the right. And then if I turn on, let's see, where is the packed? It's at the bottom. Ah, there it is. It was at a different spot on a different computer. If you turn on the tracing, it, it is actually running this. And you can see all of the output at every stage, like create critter returns one, show critter returns this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's a pretty nice way of just transparently, it's just always running your stuff in the background and you get a really, really quick feedback. If you, if you make an error, it will, it will show that to you as soon as you save it pretty quickly. Um, so this is a nice, a nice convenient way to run, run packed code. And, uh, that would be my, my recommendation, but I understand that developer environments are very personalized customized things, so do whatever makes you feel good. 
um, if you choose not to use Atom, then there's the way that is probably going to be easiest for you is just to run packed, do the env command, and then basically paste your REPL file in. That's, that's kind of the way I've been doing it. Um, and somewhere in there, you'll have a line that says load foo.packed, and that will load your packed file, and then you, you use it however you want to use it. And then you can, if, you're, if you have a REPL file and you're pasting it in, you can then continue typing other stuff. Um, and once you've loaded the packed file, you've got all of that stuff in scope. Can I do load foo.repl and already uh, get all my setup keys from the REPL file? I'm not sure. You, yes? Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Give that a try. We'll, uh, we can work with it later. So for, for the purpose of this, this uh, workshop, I would probably recommend this. If you are going to go further and like want to actually set up a server and get to an environment that is more like the real environment that you would be working with in a blockchain with keys and that, then we actually have the ability to run a server here. You create a config.yaml file, which we have an example of in our GitHub repo. And you, uh, it, it also needs a log directory. And then you just run packed-s config.yaml. And then you're running a server. And you can use uh, an HTTP API, which is documented on our docs page, for interacting with that in a way that's much more realistic to the way that you would actually do it in the real world. Um, I'm not going to touch on that today because it's a little bit more overhead, requires a little more tools to actually interact with the HTTP API that we have. So my recommendation would be using just the REPL like we have here at the top. Um, or Atom if you're, if you're interested in Atom. Anyone going to plan to use Atom? No. Cool. Power users. So here are some resources which you will want to have open while, while we're going through the workshop, especially this official documentation resource here the, at our packedlanguage.readthedocs page. That is, is pretty much going to be your definitive source of things. I have not really done step-by-step -step, like here's what code you're going to write. So a lot of this is going to be me just providing a motivation and you actually working through it and, and figuring these things out today. I, I kind of feel that that's a, a more effective way to learn things. So, so yeah, you're going you're gonna to need to be exploring this stuff and we are here to, to help. I can answer questions. We have Cadena people in the back. Joel can answer questions. Linda can answer questions as well. Um, so... That's, that's the, the plan that I have for this. Um, and again, you can get these slides here and get these links that way. Any questions before we move on? Good. So, Crypto Critters, what are we going to write? How many of you are familiar with Crypto Kitties? Two thirds. Okay. Crypto Kitties are these, these charming little guys. This was, uh, I think CryptoKitties came out around September-ish of last year, if, I, if my memory is correct, September, October-ish. And they really got a lot of, a lot of uh, popularity very quickly, and they kind of overwhelmed the Ethereum network. Lots of people were trading CryptoKitties, this, this kitty here at the bottom right is the Genesis kitty. It's the very first kitty ever, that ever existed. And it has, at, at what, later on, it eventually sold for the equivalent of more than $100,000. So clearly there was, there was uh, some, some kind of bubbly demand craziness going on. And I started looking into it and I thought it would be a fun topic for this workshop. So the goal of the rest of today is for you to write your own kind of back-end version of CryptoKitties or I'm calling it CryptoCritters. 
because you could insert your your critter arbitrary critter here. Um, if we look at this kitty, the kitty has has a DNA like a I, I think it's probably 256 bit number that they have a function that is proprietary that converts this DNA into this representation of this kitty. Visually, um, like the kitty bio probably gets created from, from that. Uh, the attributes, they have, a, they have a whole bunch of stuff that uh, makes these, these creatures kind of lovable and viral. <laughs> But it all, at the end of the day, is a bit string. Some kind of bits of DNA that they set up to map to the attributes of the kitties. And they have an owner. So you can, you can create a cat, uh, and, so, and then it's, it can be traded. It has an owner, and only its owner can, can trade it. This is like the definitive page for defining CryptoKitties. So because this is stored on a blockchain and this site uses the state in the blockchain to, to uh, determine the state of the world, everyone can know that, that a per particular individual owns this particular CryptoKitty. So they're non-fungible tokens that can be traded. And... That's what, we're, that's what we're trying to build here. Kitties are released every 15 minutes by the CryptoKitties people. A new kitty is, is released, and this will go on for like a year or two. Some, some preset amount of time, they're going re to be releasing kitties. And then the, those are called Gen Zero Kitties, the, the original generation. Once, though, once you have any of those kitties, you can breed two kitties together to get another one. And this is where the interest sort of comes in. You can, you can purchase two kitties. You can breed them. You can get some derivative kitty that is unique and a special snowflake. And uh, apparently a lot of people got interested in it. So... That's, that's kind of what the goal is for today, is building just a back end. What, what do we need to do in order to accomplish that? Well, we need to be able to create these things. We need to be able to, to remember attributes of them, like who, who, create, or who owns them now, what their DNA string is, what generation they are, the IDs of the parent kitties, so you can kind of determine pedigree. This is the kind of state that is involved in, in creating this thing. So that is, that is what we're trying to do. And I think it provides a really nice platform to introduce a lot of packed concepts. So here's the outline of, of what I would like to accomplish. Um, First step, just get basic critter creation working. Um, we'll spend some time on that. I'm, I'm not sure how long each of these steps are going to take. So uh, we're, we're going to have a bit of a flexible outline and, and plan for the rest of the day. But we'll, we'll do some critter creation. I'll, I'll like give you the basic overview of all of these steps to get you started and then let you, let you hammer on it yourselves. Once we can create critters, then we want to we want to be able to transfer ownership. So then we'll add on the ability to do ownership transfers. Um, once we can do that, once we can transfer ownership, anybody transfer ownership, then we want to make make sure that those are permissioned, so that only the person who owns that particular kitty can transfer the ownership of the kitty. After after that, then we'll try to make those ownership transfers safe. We'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. Then we'll work on some simple breeding, like just, just basically create a function that lets you breed two kitties. And then a more realistic breeding, asynchronous permissioned breeding, where one owner 
of a cat can say, I want to make this cat available to be bred. And then another owner can come along and say, oh, I want to breed my cat with that one. And then the breeding happens and we will uh, we'll investigate that. And then a stretch goal, clock auctions, which I'll talk about if we get there. Um, that's how, that's how crypto kitties does the auctions for their, their kitties for, for kitties that are for sale and also for breeding kitties. There's also a clock auction underlying, underlying that as well. And so maybe we can get to that today. If we don't, I don't think it's a huge problem. I think, I think the, the previous steps are get you a good, good bit of the way there to having a, a functional or, or like having a picture of how to get a functional crypto kitty implementation question uh, i had many questions I, I don't know maybe you're going to answer to these questions anyway later but before we start coding i would have liked an understanding of the data model of your blockchain and in, uh, the data environment model of your <coughs> yeah of your blockchain the underlying language to understand what what are the uh, the data structures or the basic uh, storage or okay um yeah, I, I can give, give a quick overview of that, and then I'd say in the docs uh, will be the, the more enlightening one. But basically, we Pact is also kind of a database language, a little bit. And it, it runs with a SQLite database, and all data that you want to be persisted is, has to be persisted in a table. So you define a schema for that table, and then you, there are some functions to create the table, and then you can do operations on that table. So if you want, like, you, you must use a table for all persisted information. And this is a really good question because one thing that you're probably going to run into pretty quickly that, that I didn't specifically mention in my slides is if you, you might want to give kitties a, a unique ascending ID, like an auto-incrementing key. And if you want to do that, the, the, the database that PACT uses is, is really more of a key value store. And the keys are always strings because that's, that's generally the convention that key value stores use. So the, your keys are strings. We don't have native auto-incrementing IDs because it's a string key. So you're gonna, you, if you want an auto-incrementing ID, which I have not specified in my, my framework for you. You can choose to do that. You can choose to do not auto-incrementing and just have, have like unique um, descriptive IDs, random ID, oh, ah, <laughs> random, random gets interesting. Um, but if you wanted to do the auto-incrementing one, you're gonna have to have a table that stores the count of how many, how many kitties there are and then you'll, you'll read from that table when you create a kitty to assign that kitty's ID. Um, does, that, does that give you a, enough of an answer? Uh, do you have a model for uh, contracts talking to each other or something like that, or looking at the state of the blockchain or looking at the state of other contracts? Or? So you can use... I think, it, I think it might even be the use function, if I remember correctly, to, you, to like import a module, another, another packed module into your code. We are not gonna deal with that here because I, I just decided to kind of cut the scope uh, and, and didn't include that. But yes, there, there is a way to have, have one packed module defined in one, by one person and then import another one somewhere else. And I believe the way that actually gets done which, which we think is, is a positive selling point, is the code gets inlined. And therefore, you don't have, you're never going to run into left pad problems where <laughs> the GitHub repo that you, your whole ecosystem depends on goes away. <laughs> and now the whole, the whole ecosystem is broken. Yeah. Um, so we, we view that a, as a positive attribute of PACT. But can you access the state of other contracts? Can you? Uh, that is a good question. I'm not sure. Do you know, Joel? I think I think it's permissioned. So, you can, you can. okay, you can, well, you can you can if you can run other contracts, then I guess you can de facto access yes. their state because they can access their state. Yes. And so I think by default tables are 
private to the admin key of that module. And then you can create functions that other people can call to do whatever it is that they need to do. That's kind of what we're, we're going to be building out here. I'm going to give you some type signatures for, for various these various steps along the way. And then your job is going to be to fill in the type signatures and actually implement the, the, the workings of it. Any other questions? Was very good questions, by the way. Um, it's easy to to uh, take some of these for some of these things for granted. So critter creation. Let's let's dive into the details. This is the data structure that I'm going to recommend you use for critters. Some of this is is directly inspired by the actual CryptoKitties implementation. And as we can see here, we've got basically five fields. Your, your generation number, your owner ID, which is going to be a key, or, or in PACT, we call it a key set. That's the actual type is key set. Um, the matron ID and the sire ID are IDs of other kitties that were the parents of this, this kitty. I think maybe... If I, if I remember correctly, all of the plan for the workshop today, none of them may require matron ID and sire ID. So you could conceivably leave those things out. But uh, I think it's, it's reasonable to, to uh, include those as well. Um, yeah. So are these IDs, like, so let's say we're defining the critter data schema. Uh, would the type of those IDs be critter data as well? Or is there some sort of like synthetic ID? So you can choose. In my implementation, which I have not made public because I, I want to actually uh, eliminate the I, the chance for for just using someone else's code here. I think I think part of the point is actually struggling through this yourself. Um, in my code, I used integer IDs, but there is a little bit of impedance mismatch there because. It, the, the IDs, the actual IDs of the rows that PACT uses are all strings. So you could choose to use strings as your IDs. That, I, I will leave that choice up to you. Uh, my, my way of implementing this was to use integer IDs and make them auto-incrementing because that's closer to the way that CryptoKitties works. Like if you, if you look at... This, this is the, the Genesis kitty, and if we look at it, it's kitty slash one. So that's the way that they, they did it, and it just seemed like it, as good as a scheme as any for me. So what's it, under what situation would you use the key set type? Ah, so the key set type is going to be for the owner. This is this is like a, a public key key oh, set, so like not like a database key key set. So is this like an intrinsic concept? There's this like separate notion of, <coughs> of owners as compared to just contract data. There is a built-in key set type. Pact has a built-in key set type, which is there because we want to handle the crypto stuff for you, and the key set type. Uh, I, I didn't go into details in my slides, but it gives you a fair amount of flexibility. It's, it's key set specifically because it's not just a single key. There are applications where you actually want to have, a, have several keys in a key set, and you want to be able to define what is the, what is the requirement scheme for validation. You, you, there are situations where you want any one of the keys in the key set to be valid, and then you're good. There are situations where you want all of the keys in the key set to be valid, and then you're good. So key set is, is a data type that takes care of all of that stuff for you. So if you're going to talk about like actual owners in the real world that you would normally deal with public keys, then you're going to use the key set data type. So owner, the owner field here is going to be of type key set. That one I'll, I'll definitely tell you for sure. The, the data type for generation is going to be integer. 
The data type for matron ID and sire ID, I'll, I chose integer, but I would say you can, you can do string if you want. Um, the data type for genes, whoops, I would suggest using a string for that. And, and interpret it as like a, a string of, of hex or base 64 digits. Uh, and then later on, you can do your crossover operations by just using take and drop on, on strings. Like I, I mentioned critter IDs here. I chose the integers, um, and I track them in this, in this separate table, which only ever has one row. And you just update that row. So with that, here is the kind of the, the outline of code that you, should, you will probably want to use to get started with. This define key set line is going to be present in all of your packed files. You have to define some key set. And then in your module, we say module critters, and we define the, the key set that is the admin key set for that module. And then we have a comment or a, a doc string. And then after the doc string, we have all of the definitions of the module. And uh, I believe that's, that's all we've got. Have at creating critters and ask me questions uh, as much as you want. Let's see, it is 11.15 now. I don't have a great idea of how long this will take, but um, we're, we're gonna break for lunch at noon. Let's try to at least get through critter creation by noon. I think that's a reasonable goal. It's, it may be the case that you guys crank through it and uh, we get through it much quicker than that and we can move on, but I think that would be my plan of attack for now. How's that sound? Any, any comments, questions? So those uh, indexing operations, like add from JSON, uh -huh. is that safe? Define safe. Uh, will there be some uh, exception system? Ah, that's, that's a great question. Pact kind of punts, oh, it doesn't punt on this. It's, it answers it in what I think is the right way, which your, your pact just fails. If, if there is ever a failure, then it just fails and it gets completely rolled back. And there's no catching. There's no catching. It's just done. So if you, let's say you have a function, create uh, transfer a kitty, right? You own a kitty, which that'll be the next function we write. You have this function transfer kitty, and you have to give it a kitty ID, and it is going to do an at or some kind of a lookup that could fail. If that lookup fails, that, that just doesn't execute, and nothing gets impacted in the blockchain. So we think that that makes things really nice. We, we, you really just kind of don't handle exceptions Unless, unless you actually need to, you know, handle some flow control state. We have some, some primitives called enforce that you can say enforce that this thing is true. And if that fails, boom, the pact is, is done. Now, your module isn't done, right? You uploaded your module to the blockchain, but then someone else came along and said, I want to execute this thing, transfer critter five to person, you know, to key X, Y, Z. And if critter five doesn't exist, that will just fail. And that person that executed that thing, that just will have, it'll be a no op essentially, as far as the, the kitty's state is concerned in pact. Does that, yes, that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Question? Right, now this is my, um, back here, 
I suggested to use string as your genes. The reason this is integer is because it came from my code and I used integer. Um, so I should probably update my slides. But uh, yeah, you can use, you can use, I would recommend using string for your genes. I'll actually change that right now. Do I need new spaces after my, my uh, colon or is it just... Uh, the, the colons need to have no spaces because Lisp, Lisp syntax spaces separate the items of your list. Okay. So these colons are specifically type annotations and no spaces. Okay. So you said it was uh, not true complete. Is there actually a termination checker built in, or is that you can't you can't write recursive functions? Oh no, no recursion at all, or just not terminate. You cannot write recursive functions at all. We we supply map and fold and some some basic recursion patterns that you can use, and then you're going to be doing those operating on lists. So, so can I create a nested list of list of lists so that the, at the end level it has two to the sixty four elements? And then map over that? You can certainly do that. Um, and I think early on, I don't, this was before, before I joined the company, but I think early on they, they put Pact out there and then someone on the internet did just that. And they're like, your thing sucks, it crashed my browser. Well, you wrote a doubling thing that obviously was going to crash the browser. So, um, De you can also do def schema, right. um, and there it might says, be it def schema. It said must be declared within the module. Right. The doc yeah, 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 yeah. Schemas need to be inside of a module. Uh, the def packed thing we're not going to get into in this workshop. Yes. So these are side effecting functions, but, but the only side effects they can have are changing the state in, yes. inside okay. the blockchain. Right. Can you mutate local let bindings or anything like that? No. No. Let bindings are, are Haskell style uh, defined ones. You can shadow them. Yeah. So there's, there's a let star, which lets you build several bindings that refer to previous ones, and that's the way you would do it if you wanted to mutate something. And definitely keep the questions coming because there's, there's all kinds of things that I can probably cut through a fair amount of, of hunting on your part and just point you to the right thing.